Well, good afternoon and uh, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, the Vice President and I are very pleased to welcome you to our press conference. We'll now report on uh, the outcome of today's meeting of the Governing Council, which was also attended by the President of the Eurogroup, Mr. Dyselblum, and by the Commission Vice President, Mr. Dombrovskis. Uh, based on our regular economic and monetary analysis, we decided to keep the key ECB interest rates unchanged. We continue to expect them to remain at their present levels for an extended period of time and well past the horizon of our net asset purchases. Regarding non-standard monetary policy measures, we confirm that from January 2018, we intend to continue to make net asset purchases under the asset purchase program at a monthly pace of 30 billion euro until the end of September 2018 or beyond if necessary and in any case until the governing council sees a sustained adjustment in the path of inflation consistent with its inflation aim. If the outlook becomes less favorable, or if financial conditions become inconsistent with further progress towards a sustained adjustment in the path of inflation, we stand ready to increase the asset purchase program in terms of size and or duration. The Euro system will reinvest the principal payments for maturing securities purchased under the asset purchase program for an extended period of time after the end of its net asset purchases, and in any case, for as long as necessary. This will contribute both to favorable liquidity conditions and to an appropriate monetary policy stance. Our monetary policy decisions have preserved the very favorable financing conditions that are still needed for sustained return of inflation rates towards levels that are below but close to 2%. The incoming information, including our staff projections, our new staff projections, indicates a strong pace of economic expansion and a significant improvement in the growth outlook. The strong cyclical momentum and the significant reduction of economic slack give grounds for greater confidence that inflation will converge towards our inflation aim. At the same time, domestic price pressures remain muted overall and have yet to show convincing signs of a sustained upward trend. An ample degree of monetary stimulus therefore remains necessary for underlying inflation pressures to continue to build up and support headline inflation developments over the medium term. This continued monetary support is provided by the additional net asset purchases that we decided on at our October monetary policy meeting by the sizable stock of acquired assets and the forthcoming reinvestments, and by our forward guidance on interest rates. Let me now explain our assessment in greater detail, starting with the economic analysis. The economic expansion in the euro area continued in the third quarter of 2017, when real GDP increased by 0.6% quarter on quarter, after 0.7% in the second quarter. The latest data and survey results point to solid and broad-based growth momentum. Our monetary policy measures, which have facilitated the deleveraging process, continue to support domestic demand. Private consumption is underpinned by ongoing em employment gains which are also benefiting from past labor market reforms and by rising household wealth. Business investment continues to strengthen on the back of a very favorable financing conditions, 
rising corporate profitability, and strengthening demand. Housing investment has also risen further over recent quarters. In addition, euro area exports are being supported by the broad-based global expansion. This assessment is broadly reflected in the December 2017 Eurosystem staff macroeconomic projections for the euro area. These projections foresee annual rate GDP increasing by 2.4 in 2017, 2.3 in 2018, 1.9% in 2019, 1.7% in 2020. Compared with the September 2017 ECB staff macroeconomic projections, the outlook for real GDP growth has been revised up substantially. Risk surrounding the euro area growth outlook remain broadly balanced. On the one hand, the strong cyclical momentum underpinned by continued positive developments in sentiment indicators could lead to further positive growth surprises in the near term. On the other hand, downside risks continue to relate primarily to global factors and developments in foreign exchange markets. According to Eurostat's flash estimate, euro area annual HICP inflation was 1.5% in November, up from 1.4% in October. At the same time, measures of underlying inflation have moderated somewhat recently, in part owing to special factors. Looking ahead on the basis of current future prices for oil, annual rates of headline inflation are likely to moderate in the coming months, mainly reflecting base effects in energy prices before increasing again. Underlying inflation is expected to rise gradually over the medium term, supported by our monetary policy measures, the continuing economic expansion, the corresponding absorption of economic slack, and rising wage growth. This assessment is also broadly reflected in the December 2017 Eurosystem staff macroeconomic projections for the euro area, which foresee annual HICP inflation at 1.5 in 2017, 1.4 in 2018, 1.5 in 2019, and 1.7 in 2020. Compared with September 2017 ECB staff macroeconomic projections, the outlook for headline HICP inflation has been revised up, mainly reflecting higher oil prices and food, higher food prices. Turning to the monetary analysis, broad money, M3, continues to expand at a robust pace with an annual rate of growth of 5% in October 2017 from 5.2% in September, reflecting the impact of the ECB's monetary policy measures and the low opportunity cost of holding the most liquid deposits. Accordingly, the narrow monetary aggregate M1 continued to be the main contributor to broad money growth, expanding at an annual rate of 9.4% in October after 9.8% in September. The recovery in the growth of loans to the private sector observed since the beginning of 2014 is proceeding. The annual growth rate of loans to non-financial corporations increased to 2.9 in October 2017, after 2.4% in September, with the annual growth rate of loans to households remained stable at 2.7%. The pass-through of the monetary policy measures put in place since June 2014 continues to significantly support borrowing conditions for firms and households, access to financing, 
notably for small and medium-sized ent sized enterprises and credit flows across the euro area. To sum up, a cross-check of the outcome of the economic analysis with the signals coming from the monetary analysis confirmed the need for an ample degree of monetary accommodation to secure a sustained return of inflation rates towards levels that are below but close to 2%. In order to rip the full benefits from our monetary policy measures, other policy areas must contribute decisively to strengthening the longer term growth potential and reducing vulnerabilities. The implementation of structural reforms in all Euro area countries needs to be substantially stepped up to increase resilience, reduce structural unemployment, and boost Euro area productivity and growth potential. Regarding fiscal policies, the increasingly solid and broad-based expansion strengthens the, strengthens the case for rebuilding fiscal buffers. This is particularly important in countries where government debt remains high. All countries would benefit from intensifying efforts towards achieving a more growth-friendly composition of public finances. A full, transparent, and consistent implementation of the Stability and Growth Pact and of the macroeconomic imbalance procedure over time and across countries remains essential to increase the resilience of the euro area economy. Strengthening economic and monetary union remains a priority. The Governing Council welcomes the ongoing discussions on completing the banking union and the capital markets union and on further enhancing the institutional architecture of our economic and monetary union. And now we are at your disposal for questions. Ms. York. In the front row, Ms. Look. Carolyn Look, Bloomberg News. Um, Mr. Draghi, given that you see inflation at 1.7% in 2020, do you consider that sufficient progress on inflation in the medium term? And does that in any way affect your current plans for the asset purchase program? And my second question is on the corporate sector purchases. You said in October that they would remain sizable. And were any further details decided in that regard? And could you clarify whether that might mean that we will see the same amount of corporate bonds being purchased, or will simply the proportion in the overall program be higher? Thank you. Thank you. The, um, the answer to the second question is, I can't elaborate. It will remain sizable. We haven't discussed that today. So what the, the terms of, uh, of language will re remain the same as last time. On, uh, on, on the first question, uh, silly, we, uh, by and large, I mean, the overall discussion today reflected the increasing confidence that uh, we have in, uh, our, um, in, in, our, in the convergence of, uh, of inflation towards a, a self-sustained uh, inflation path in the medium term and towards our objectives. Uh, the, Generally speaking, the uh, growth news are, uh, are very positive. I can elaborate on that. Um, so all in all, the revision in the macroeconomic projections goes in the right direction. Thank you. Ms. Weisbach. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Draghi, um, Annette Weisbach for CNBC. A follow-up question on uh, when do you reckon, will you uh, give us more of an idea of how the QE program or the asset purchase program will look like after September? There's much speculation. It could be as late as July, perhaps June. Perhaps you already have a vision um, or an idea. Second question would be on whether you had in the governing council or yourself um, thoughts about what <clears throat> it means that the ultra-loose monetary policy stance is most likely still in place when we see the economy cooling down once again. 
um, meaning that you could be left with not a lot of ammunition as a central bank to counter an economic downturn, i.e. a reduced trend of inflation. What's your idea here? Thank you. Thank you. The second question I can answer that we haven't discussed that. Um, frankly, it doesn't seem likely today. It's actually seem, in a sense, it seems even more remote possibility than it would have been a year ago or even six months ago. Um, but on, on the other point, really, uh, if, we, if we go through the statement I just made, um, just let me just go uh, step by step. First of all, the forward guidance on interest rate is unchanged, no? We say we continue to expect interest rates to remain at the present level for an extended period of time and well past the horizon of our net asset purchases. Second, we confirm that from January 2019, we intend to continue to make the net asset purchase under the asset purchase program at a monthly play pace of 30 until the end of September 2018 or beyond if necessary, and in any case until the governing council sees, etc. So there isn't any change in, uh, in the language or intentions. Third, Quite important, the euro system will reinvest the principal payments from maturing securities purchased for an extended period of time after the end of the net asset purchases, and in any case, as long as necessary. And then we add the, uh, the considerations on inflation, where even though uh, situation on growth has improved, and by the way, will continue to improve, has improved more than expected and will continue to improve. That's what the old sentiment indicators say and also our projections, our staff's projections say. The news on inflation is uh, remain, remain somewhat uh, muted. We say price pressures remain muted and have to sh yet to show convincing signs on a sustained upward trend. So an ample degree of conclusion is an ample degree of monetary stimulus, therefore, remains necessary for underlying inflation pressures to continue to build up and support headline inflation developments over the medium term. So no, no, no change all throughout. Mr. Sims. Thank you. Tom Sims for Reuters. Um, did you discuss cutting the link in your guidance between the APP and inflation? And what is your view on that question? And uh, secondly, on the 1.7% uh, inflation uh, pr uh, prognosis, uh, do you maintain what you said last year that 1.7% is not really in line with the target? <laughs> so uh, the, um, first of all, we didn't discuss cutting the link. Um, it's, uh, that was not discussed. Uh, we. Uh, here, you see, but I, it's probably worthwhile spending a word on that. Um, as, as the economic, uh, uh, we, as you notice, we haven't used the word recovery. We use the word expansion. As the economic expansion f gains further strength and keeps on broadening, naturally, naturally, the stimulus will come, and we said that in the introductory statement, will come from all the elements of the package. And, uh, and, uh, and, and therefore, it, as a consequence, also the component of coming from the forward guidance uh, of interest rates will gain further and further importance. So this is a natural uh, process led by the recovery. In this sense, our monetary policy accompanies the recovery as I had chance to say in a, in a speech some time ago. But we haven't discussed the cutting, cutting the link. No, we aren't there. And um, now, the other point is 1.7. Well, see, it's, we, we defined, the answer is uh, it's close but below 2%, and, uh, but it's not, as, how close is it? The issue here is more how strong is the convergence path towards a self-sustained and sustainable inflation rate, which is close but below 2% in the medium term. And uh, the developments that we are witnessing on the real economy certainly increase our confidence for uh, an output gap that will get closed in the course of the next year. 
and, um, and improving conditions in the labor markets, which in due time should increase pressure on nominal wages. As you know, that has been one of the variables we've been looking, more, we've been looking uh, as, um, as uh, the, one of the drivers of the underlying inflation, and therefore one of the drivers for a sustained progress in headline inflation. Mr. Witz. Um, <clears throat> given the uh, Christian Fitz from Market News, uh, given the favorable economic outlook, and uh, also <clears throat> given the revisions uh, for growth, which is uh, significant, which you mentioned, uh, will you permanently review the APP while it is running, or are the volumes and the duration of the uh, program, let's say, carved in stone at least until September next year? Um, my second question um, is also on the APP. Has there been, again, a discussion today uh, about the open-ended design of the APP? Thank you. Yes, actually, it's one question, really. Uh, the, um, the program has been designed, discussed, desi designed, and, and decided upon uh, a month and a half ago. Uh, today, the issue was not discussed at all. Uh, that is what stands in place, both as far as the size, the volumes, the timing, and the open-endedness of the program. Mr. Jakish? Klaus Anna Jakish, ARD German Television. Mr. President, the Federal Reserve yesterday increased the interest rates again, and it looks like that uh, it is going to happen again very soon. And apparently more rapid than we all thought, which means that the gap between the interest rates in Europe and the, in America becomes more and more wider. Isn't the um, governing council concerned that this might have quite significant effects and negative effects uh, for the European economy? And secondly, touching again on the inflation outlook, um, given the really robust economy at the moment and uh, having in mind the discussions you had in Sintra over the last two years about the reasons of low inflation and now looking at the new projections is it really very likely that we will see the two percent in the foreseeable future again thank you thank you um on, on the first question the difference uh, in the monetary policy decisions and therefore in uh, the interest rate decisions that were taken uh, on the other side of the ocean reflects the different positions of the two areas in the economic recovery. The economic recovery in the United States is, uh, at the present time, by the way, it's stronger in Europe than, than in the United States, but the stage at which the economic recovery is in the United States is what more advanced. And especially so when we look at the wages behavior, the nominal wages behavior. So the monetary policy uh, does reflect the differences in uh, the stage at which the two jurisdictions, the two areas are. Um, the, so, but the, the, the other question you asked is whether this affects negatively the European economy. We haven't seen any effect from this, meaning that the present constellation of rates by and large reflects the differences in the stage at which the two economies are. So that is the, um, now about the, whether we are confident whether we'll reach our objective, uh, the answer is certainly today more than we were two months ago. That is certainly so. It's, uh, it's pretty clear that the uh, the, the, the strengthening of the economy is the basis upon which the output gap will close, the labor market conditions will improve, and we, are, we discussed this exactly in Sintra and in other places, how the, uh, in the end the wages will react to these uh, improving conditions in the labor market, in spite of the many factors that I've discussed in Sintra. And these factors are there, there's no question, they are there, but by and large, they tend to be factors that will disappear with the, the negative effect of these factors will disappear with the continuing improving, improvement in the labor market. Thank you. Mr. Malin. 
Jan Merlin, Handelsblatt. Um, Mr. President, um, some of your colleagues have expressed um, confidence, uh, like Ms. Mr. Curé or Mr. Weidmann or Mr. Knott, have expressed confidence that the asset purchases will end in September. Um, do you share their view? And my second question, um, the ECB has also bought um, Steinhoff bonds uh, last summer uh, and, and the company is now in, in trouble. Do you take any consequences for, for the APP because of that or are you investigating uh, con to take consequences? Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, the, um, well, the governing council in, um, we didn't discuss this today, by the way, but last discussion we had a month and a half ago showed that the governing council, its vast majority, uh, wants, the, uh, wants to keep, to retain the open-endedness feature of the, of the uh, asset purchase program as it's been designed in the last monetary policy uh, council. Uh, so that's the answer to the first point, and it's motivated uh, by basically the fact that in spite of the uh, significant improvement in uh, the real economy, in GDP growth, in the labor market, and frankly in all, uh, uh, in all uh, sentiment indicators, in all business confidence, consumer confidence indicators, in all P production uh, PMIs indicators, we see this momentum. Uh, continuing unabated and broadening its uh, its um, its scope. In spite of this, the uh, decision is justified by the fact that on the inflation side, you know, our mandate is defined in terms of price stability. So ultimately, that is the, our yardstick, and in, because of that, basically, the governing council wants to maintain a steadfast commitment to price stability in keeping, in retaining the open-endedness of the, of the program. Um, your second point about, about the bonds, uh, uh, well, first of all, let me say that this program, this program is uh, uh, one of our policy tools that we consider important, very important, for the attainment of our mandate. The scope of the program is not to maximize profits or to avoid losses. So let's keep this, this in mind. The, having said that, it, running such big corporate programs, uh, it, it's not unusual that losses may be, may be, may be happening. Um, by the way, uh, all other central banks that ran similar programs, uh, do we know whether they had losses or not? No, because they're not disclosing the issuers, the issues, the volumes, the holdings, they should disclose very, very little. So if anything, we are different because we are much, much more transparent about our program. So uh, what we did, uh, by the way, let me also say that we are consulting with the governing council, so we, I cannot elaborate a lot about what we're going to do next. But certainly, uh, we, we have a risk framework which has served very, very well since the beginning of the existence of the ECB. Uh, and certainly, if we, if we need to draw lessons, we'll, do, we'll certainly draw lessons from this experience. Uh, we are always open to improve, but as I said, it's been, it's been very, very good. Uh, also, as soon as we got news, we stopped. We stopped buying. Uh, so we did basically uh, what uh, was uh, required from, from us to do. And uh, also let me add that the, um, the losses that uh, have been reported are by and large exaggerated by a factor of 10 with respect to the, the, actual, uh, the, actual, um, uh, the actual measure of the losses. But, but, but having said that, uh, having said all this, the losses are there. They, have not, they are not realized. And so the issue is uh, who is going to pay for these losses? And the answer is that these losses really represent a small digit factor number of our 1.6 billion net interest income we produced last year. Thank you. Ms. Jones?
Claire Jones, Financial Times. Um, so just to follow up to that answer on the Steinhoff debt, is the consideration at the moment about selling your holding of the debt? And for the second question, um, I'd just like to clarify your answer to the question about whether 1.7% inflation is good enough because you seem to be saying that if the output gap closes as we expect and the recovery continues as we expect then 1.7 percent is in fact good enough would that be a, a fair reading of of your assessment it wouldn't be, <laughs> it wouldn't be a fair reading and um, we we our, our objective is an inflation rate close but below two percent which does by the way it doesn't mean that it has to be um it's, it can go over 2%, then come back. We're talking about in the medium term. Let's never forget that. And it has self-sustainable and self-sustained, namely has to be there without our monetary policy support. So uh, it's, uh, it's, it's quite early before we talk about, uh, about um, changing our monetary policy support, support though in the presence of a an expansion which is gaining momentum, our confidence towards this objective is actually increasing. As I said before, it's gr certainly greater than it was in the last monetary policy meeting. Uh, on the first point, that's what I meant where I cannot elaborate more when I answered before because we are consulting with the rest of the governing council. Mr. Fellas. Tom Fellas from the Wall Street Journal. Um, the recovery in, Euro, in the Eurozone has been going on for four and a half years now, almost five years. Um, and your balance sheet is still expanding and interest rates are expected to stay uh, below zero for the next year or two. Um, are you concerned that when the next recession arrives, you might be hampered by having too few tools to, to, to address that? Is that something that enters into your, um, your calculations? And uh, the second question is on the US tax reform. Um, some European politicians have complained that it discriminates against foreign companies. Have, have you um, uh, any thoughts about how the tax reform as it stands might impact the Eurozone, might impact in investment um, in Europe, and whether it's, it's, uh, there's an unfair element to it? Thanks. Uh, thank you. As far as your second question is concerned, I can't really answer, because the answer is we haven't discussed it. And uh, we'll also have to, at some point, we'll certainly look into the overall tax package and we'll uh, come out with assessments. Though, don't forget that taxation is not in, our, uh, in, in the realm of our uh, competences. Uh, but certainly, in, in order to assess whether this is going to have an impact on the European economy, we will certainly look into this. But we haven't done it yet. The, uh, on, on your first point, uh, it, it, it does echo a, 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 a previous question. Um, at this point in time, this is, I would say, something which the likelihood of which is very, very small. And so the issue, the, but the issue is important. The issue is more generally one of policy space. Uh, do we have policy space in case something unforeseen unlikely happens. But the issue of policy space doesn't concern only the monetary policy. It concerns first and foremost the need to make our economies more resilient to unforeseen events which cannot be dealt with by anti-cyclical policies or by monetary policy. So first and foremost, we say this, you know, we said it so many times at the end of the introductory statement, this appeal to structural reforms, that's what we should aim at. And uh, second, the, policy, the fiscal policy space is also very limited to cope with, uh, with sudden uh, downturns, and that's why we are pleading for rebuilding fiscal buffers using the, uh, the benefits of this, uh, of this economic expansion. Mr. Melli. Alessandro Melli with Sole 24 Ore. You've restated that the outlook 
is dependent on uh, uh, your an ample support from monetary policy. Do you feel that over the past few months uh, this dependency has decreased, that the uh, expansion, as you call it, uh, has become less dependent on uh, the support from your monetary policy? That's my first question. My second question is, Chair Yellen just uh, ended her mandate uh, with the uh, in interest rates increase. Do you see yourself, uh, although it's still quite some time away, uh, raising interest rates before you go? Well, the, the answer to the second question is, uh, I cannot say how I see myself. But silly, if we are to raise interest, interest rates, it would be the, uh, I mean, a good news all in all, because it would mean that we, uh, are back on a, on, a, on a path to an inflation rate which is self-sustained and sustainable through the medium term. Uh, the uh, first question is, the answer to your first question is whether this is, is a yes. Uh, our monetary policy has accompanied first the recovery and now is accompanying the expansion of the European, of the Eurozone economy. And um, as, uh, as the recovery was gaining strength and breadth, uh, the nominal amount of monetary accommodation has gone down so much that we halved the asset purchase program monthly flows. So we took decisions to accommodate the monetary size of our monetary accommodation to the, uh, to the growing economy, to the economy which was previously recovering and now expanding. Mr. Kalb? Eric Kalb, Live Squawk News. And Mr. President, there's been a lot of talk about perhaps the bond purchases and the asset purchasing, purchasing going beyond uh, September next year. There's also been some discussion about whether or not you have to change policy to make that happen at the ECB. Has that been discussed already and have you been preparing changes to the policy so you can extend the uh, asset purchases beyond September next year? Also, what kind of discussions have been going on within the governing council about possible bubbles in sectors of the, um, in the market or the economy and how exiting the asset purchase plan could impact those bubbles? The answer to the first question is no. Uh, we haven't discussed changes. And the answer to the second question is, is more generally, we always discuss financial stability issues, and uh, we certainly closely monitor the financial stability risks that may, that may emerge from a situation where we had uh, very, very low interest rates for a long period of time, abundant liquidity for a long period of time, so the, the ground is fertile for these risks. Uh, at the same time, we are not seeing systemically uh, important financial stability risks. We see uh, local spots where uh, valuations uh, tend to be overstretched. Uh, but uh, also, as soon as you ask this question, one should also ask the question, how's leverage? Because the bubble is also the outcome of two components. So how's leverage behaving? And there, differently from other parts of the world, we don't see leverage uh, for the private sector going up as uh, for the whole of the Eurozone. As a matter of fact, uh, debt uh, continues to, debt to GDP or debt to value added or debt to assets, uh, depending on the measure, the RST continues to decrease with different intensity, of course, depending on, on the measure. So we, we don't see um, the other component, uh, e even in those local situations. Now, of course, we go through different markets and we assess whether the, uh, the markets are closer or not to develop a financial stability situation. So there are markets where valuations have, more, have been more stretched than others. And then we ask ourselves, what is, the, what is the right answer to this problem? And the right answer is have in place macroprudential instruments that are effective, strong, and well-targeted to cope with these risks. 
Certainly, it's not to change monetary policy because of a financial stability risk in a certain part or in a certain market of the Eurozone. Mr. Madeleine? Um, Thibault Madeleine with the French newspaper Les Echos. Um, Germany hasn't had a government, a proper government, for the last three months and uh, may well not have any uh, until March or April. Um, you mentioned completing the banking union in your statement. How confident are you that, considering this lack of political stability in the biggest Eurozone economy, um, the European Union will be able to complete the banking union this year? Well, I, think, uh, <clears throat> well, I think your question identifies a real problem we have in a, in a part of the world where, uh, uh, where um, I mean, democracy exists. So with democracy, you have elections. With elections, you have governments that need to be formed. And the citizens of this part of the world take the time that's necessary to form a government that is stable and effective. So we have our views about what should be done about the Eurozone, but of course, we are entirely in the hands of the citizens of Europe to decide how to decide how to pursue these views uh, in a, in a democratically uh, in a democratically accepted fashion. So it's not in our hands to decide the timing, and, and to some extent even the shape. Uh, we have our views. We think uh, technically what it should be done in order to make our economic, and, uh, our economic and monetary union stronger than it is today. But how and how fast this will be achieved, it's not in our hands. Mr. Dodakopoulos. Stefanos Georgakopoulos, Deutsche Welle. Mr. President, uh, do you expect uh, another, a fourth adjustment program for Greece? Um, and if not, how will be the liquidity of the Greek uh, banks uh, be ensured? And my second question, would you like to comment uh, on the legal prosecutions of the former chief of the Greek statistical authority, Andreas Georgiou, as well as three members of the Hellenic Asset Development Fund? Thank you. Thank you. On, on, on the first question, it's entirely in the hands of the government to decide about the fourth program. Uh, it, um, if, if the Greek economy has fragilities that need to have a program to be addressed, it will be up to them to decide. Um, that, uh, and, and, and as well, the, the, what you asked about the liquidity of the banks, it will, liquidity, what, what, we, what we've seen in the, in the, in the past uh, few years is that liquidity is a consequence of the economic policies that are being pursued by the governments, by the authorities, and the reception that markets give to these policies. Uh, and so they do depend on uh, ultimately on, uh, on the economic policies. On um, the other point uh, was uh, about, uh, I'm sorry, what was the other question? Oh, the legal procedures, yeah. Uh, we've made, uh, I should say, I should speak for the ECB only, but uh, we've made this point uh, on and on and on throughout the Eurogroups in all institutional setups and all this. The independence, the independence of the statistical institutions and their people is of the essence for the credibility of the data which form the basis upon which economic policies are designed, accepted, presented, and financed in the, case, in the specific case of Greece. So all actions that tend to undermine this credibility are certainly not to be shared or, um, to be shared or agreed by the, by the ECB and by the Governing Council. Now, all this is being said in full respect of the independence of judiciary of every country, of course. Thank you. Mr. Schroes. 
Thank you, Mark Schröers, Börsenzeitung. Um, the first one is on, on your risk assessment. Um, you today again emphasized that the risks surrounding the euro area growth outlook remain broadly balanced. Uh, what about the risks to the inflation outlook, to the medium term inflation outlook? You know, up until 2014, the governing council in its statement always gave a separate um, risk assessment for the inflation outlook. Um, if, if, if you had to do so today, what, what would you say are the risks to the downside? Are they also balanced? Are they uh, to the upside? Uh, and the other one, in October, you've indicated that um, there will be, after September 2018, in any case, a kind of tapering, uh, no sudden stop uh, to QE. Um, it seems no sudden stop to QE after September. Um, it seems as uh, this was not discussed on the Governing Council at that time. Did you discuss it today? And would you stick to your wording that there will be no sudden stop? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The, um now, the risk to the inflation, uh, we can safely say that deflation risks have disappeared. And uh, so it's, th that's what we can safely say. We can also safely say that, uh, that the likelihood of having uh, the low inflation in the 0 0.5, 0 0.6 that we've seen until, what, a year ago has certainly decreased. But I don't think we can go beyond that. Frankly, we cannot go beyond that. We see that um, the, the muted response of wages to the improving conditions in the market, uh, in the labor markets, and more generally to the closing of the output gap is, uh, uh, is, um, is, a, is, is somewhat of a, somewhat, uh, if compared with other recoveries and economic expansions, is way, way slower than we had in the past. So this uh, cautions about, while our confidence that things are going definitely better also on the inflation front, uh, that cautions us uh, from, uh, from making bold statements about, um, about the fact that inflation cannot turn down and become again low for long. So we think it's, it's, it's certainly less probability, but, uh, but no, I wouldn't go beyond that today. The, um, the, oh, the sudden stop, the, the, I was asked about, sudden stop means that we go from 30 to zero, okay? No, we never had that, I mean, we never discussed that, period. But whether sudden stop becomes the, an extension of the program or becomes tapering, that's what you want to know. We haven't discussed that too. And the final question goes to Mr. Bornderman. Thank you. Um, Dutch uh, Central Bank President uh, Klaas Knot said in a um, speech late November that the asset purchase program has run its course and that, that it should be fully phased out uh, after September. And one of his arguments was, I quote, with GDP growth hitting levels above 2% year on year, the monetary policy stance is increasingly out of sync with the business cycle. Now, also given the substantially revised GDP projections uh, upward. Um, do you think he has a point? Thank you. That is not the view of the Governing Council, first point. Uh, second point, our mandate is not, uh, is not uh, growth, uh, is not employment, it's price stability. So uh, we are, we are in, in a condition where we have to infer from the strength of the growth momentum and the improvement in the labor markets, what's gonna be the ultimate effect on the objective that uh, defines our mandate, which is the inflation rate. And we've qualified this objective in saying that the process towards converging, the process of convergence of this inflation rate to our objective has to be, before we can remove the ample monetary support, has to be self-sustained, i.e. not in need to be supported by our monetary policy. So that's the, that's the yardstick. And that's where we are today. And that's why we always talk about response of the nominal wages to improving conditions, because that's what we have to understand well namely the response of uh, nominal wages growth to, and the reasons why the such response is, is lagging down. 
Thank you. Thank you very much.